Let's make a fun little transition screen like this that you can maybe use when switching levels or something of the like. It's actually fairly easy to set up. So we're going to dive into this empty project over here. There will be a download below for patrons and YouTube members uh, for the full project files once finished. Uh, the only thing that I really have imported here is a quick little image stencil that I made. Uh, this is going to be the shape of the image that we like push in and out. Only thing uh, that's really like important to talk about here is that it is just an image with a black background uh, and a white shape, and that's the shape of whatever you want your transition screen to like pop in and out. You can also do this the other way around with a white background and a black shape. We'll get a little bit more into that as we make the material for this thing. So let's actually get started by doing that. Let's make the material and we'll call this something like um, transition screen. And as we open that up, we're going to need to change a couple of things right away. The material domain is not going to be surface because we're not going to be using this to shade objects in the world. This is going to be a UI element. So we're going to change it to user interface. And that makes the output here uh, change immediately into something a lot more simple. And the preview will just be entirely black for now. Uh, let's set the final color to white and make sure that that also includes the alpha being set to one. And now we'll see that the preview here is an entirely white square instead. Now we also want to set the blend mode for opaque to being masked because we're going to be masking out an image, obviously. So we need to have this opacity mask uh, input pin here. From there, we put in a texture sample node. And we're going to right click this and we will convert this to a parameter because we want to be able to set this dynamically uh, having a bunch of potential different images used for this shader. We'll just call this texture. And that texture, here we uh, either have to just go right into the opacity mask, which you will do if you use white backgrounds with black images. Personally, I like doing black backgrounds with white images uh, a little bit more because it just makes more sense to me. Uh, so if you have that as well, again, white shapes, black backgrounds, uh, you'll need to also put in a one minus node. Because what we're going to be doing is, of course, if you just use this as the alpha, all of this black stuff is going to be see-through and all the white stuff is going to be opaque. We want it to be the other way around where the white stuff is see-through and the black stuff is opaque and one minus just inverts your image. Now I'm going to set the default value here to just being our star. Again, we can set this to any image we want down the line. And then we need to be able to scale this up and down, obviously, because that's the entire effect of our screen light transition here. So what we need for that is we need to edit the texture coordinates. So you can find that with the text coord. And here we need to do a couple of things, because if we just multiply this, uh, that's not going to quite work out the way you want it to. Setting this to like two or four, it will scale it, but it will only scale it to the top left corner. We want it to scale it from the center of our image. So we need to do a little bit of extra math to do that. For that, we're going to subtract something from it. And what we're going to subtract is a vector 2, which you can just get by holding down the 2 key on your keyboard and clicking. And we'll subtract 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 from that. Then we will divide by a scalar value. So holding down 1 and clicking for that. And we're going to promote this to a parameter as well. And this will be our zoom scale. Uh, the default value of which we'll just set to 1. And then we'll add back in the 0 0.5 that we subtracted before. And with that little trick, if we now multiply this by uh, 0 0.2 or something like that, you can see it actually scales in to the center of the screen. And if we set it to 0, of course, it's entirely invisible. So we can now use this as a parameter to scale this in the way that we want to. Now, you might have the issue where if you scale this down to, let's say, 0.2, you have a bunch of other stars or whatever image you have appearing. And that is to do with your wrapping method in your texture. So if you go into your texture and you look for tiling method, it by default will be set to wrapping. And if we do that, you see that we have a bunch of stars showing up now. You want to set this to clamping instead. That way, it doesn't make like extra images when you start scaling this down. It just keeps it as empty space. And this is the entirety of what this material needs to be able to do. So uh, that's kind of all there is to that. Let's set the default value back to one though. And now we're going to make the loading screen uh, or screen wipe, whatever you want to call it, uh, widgets. So let's make a widget called WBP screen wipe. That's going to be a canvas panel because it needs to properly like scale up with the entire screen. 
and we'll put an image on that canvas panel. Now, this image, we're going to anchor to the exact center of the screen, and then we'll set the position to zero and zero. We'll set the alignment to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so that's aligned at the exact center. And then we just set the size to something that is screen filling as a whole. I like to go a little bit beyond the size of the screen as a whole, uh, so like 1950. And here's the kicker, uh, you want this to be square shaped. Because of course, this is going to be displaying our image and our image is square. So if we make this just about screen filling like this, it's gonna be squashing down our image. And then we have to take that into account with every single transitionary image that we make. So it's just easier to make this thing square shaped. 1950 by 1950 is what I go for. Then the image we're going to set to that material that we made. So M transition screen. Uh, we'll make this into a dynamic material in a moment. The reason that we're doing this as like the preview material as well is this way we can easily animate it. So let's make that animation before anything else. I will call this uh, trans in and we will be animating this image. So let's add that image and then we're going to add a track to that. And you can see we have this brush dot brush material. And from there, we can add the zoom scale because it sees, hey, this material has an exposed parameter that's animatable because it's just a scalar value. So we can animate that in here. So we can scale this up and you can see that it works properly as you would expect it to. And then let's make it take like 0.5 seconds or something like that. And we scale it down to zero. So we get this as an animation. Now you actually want to make sure that this entire animation itself also ends here. So if you just pull this back like that and then try to like pull back the red thing it'll snap to the end of the animation uh, because we're going to be using the actual end of the animation and if the animation technically keeps going even if nothing is moving anymore uh, the end of the animation doesn't happen until five seconds in which is a little bit annoying the way that that works but just make sure that your animation like properly ends at the 0.5 second mark you can of course make this one second or two seconds or whatever you want uh, I'm going to stick with 0 0.5 seconds for now. And then we'll just duplicate this uh, for a transition out. And all that we need to do here is just uh, flip these two keyframes around. So we set the value of 0 at the beginning, and then the value of whatever we had before, like 3 point something, to the end. And now this animates the other way. So that sets up our animations. Let's set up the little bit of code that we need to make this work. So in the event graph, we go into event construct. And the very first thing that we do here is we create a dynamic material instance. So the material instance that we've been using uh, over here to animate things, we're not actually gonna be using that. We make a dynamic one so that we can change the texture like on runtime if we want that to uh, be a thing that we can do. So we make a dynamic material instance of the AM transition screen. So this one. We promote that to a variable so that we can easily access it. So we'll call this just like mat for material. And then our image, we drag that in and we set brush from material and we just plug in the material that we just created. So now that brush will be using the dynamic material instance that we created. And anytime we update this material, the brush will automatically like reflect that. And from here, it's as easy as just making a couple of custom events. Uh, so let's make custom event uh, trends in event, get the trends in animation, play that animation. But before we play that animation, we want to get our image that we're going to be using this for. So we uh, get our material here and we set a texture parameter value. Now it's good to just go back into your material, go into your texture parameter, press F2 to just copy the name over. Don't want to be typing anything because that introduces room for error and we don't want to have any room for error here because a little typo might mess this entire thing up. So we connect all of those things up to each other, and then this value that we're gonna be using will just be an input parameter. So anytime we call the transition in event, we can give in the image that we wanna use. But what if we just wanna use the image that's already on there? Well, that's actually fairly easy to do. We just do an is valid, uh, the one with the question mark. So if the image that we're giving in is valid, we're gonna be updating the parameter. If not, we're just gonna be playing the animation with the material as it is already. Now let's make an event dispatcher, a finished transition, and we'll give that an input 
with a type of bool, and we'll call that a forward plate forward or something along those lines. Now, when we play this animation, we get a return value here of a object player, and we're going to then bind to animation finished. So when this animation finishes, we're going to bind to a different event, so just a custom event. And what that's going to do is it's going to call out this event dispatcher uh, and say that, hey, we just finished. So any other object, like your level loading system or whatever you might have, uh, that might be listening in for, hey, the transition screen is now finished doing its first part of the transition. I can like unload the levels and nothing is visible anymore because the transition screen isn't like, entirely still on the screen right now. I uh, can listen out for this to wait to start doing its thing. And then we kind of just do the same thing. So trans out events, but with a different animation. Now, it is entirely uh, possible to do this same thing with only one animation because you can just play the animations either forward or in reverse. I like making them different animations because if you have like different events that you want to like put on these animations because you can add an event track to animations as well, uh, that is a little bit more flexible. If you prefer doing just one animation and playing it forward uh, on the in event and then backward on the out event, that is entirely valid as well. Uh, but I'm going to stick with using two animations. So just replace the pins for the in transition to the out transition animation. And I make sure that the call finish transition uh, says played forward is false. Again, just in case any object on the other side listening out for this event dispatcher needs to know whether or not it was the forward plane animation or the backward plane animation. We have that ball. Most of the time you're probably not going to use it, but it's nice information to be able to like send through. And then we just hook up this texture parameter value to the inputs. We make sure that we check whether or not it is valid as well. And now we have the out transition working as well. So ideally you hook this up to something like a level loading system or whatever. I have a video on how I personally like to load levels using level streaming. And uh, that's how I use this exact same setup within my own game. Uh, for now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into my third person character for a little bit of a showcase on how this can work. And we're going to use the debug key, uh, like let's do F. When we press this, we will create a widget. We'll be screen wipe. We will do the transition in event. And we'll just use the default so we don't really need to put anything into this value, which you probably should name something like texture or whatever. But if you have different images uh, like this one in a lot of different shapes, you can put those in however you like. Then we will bind to finished transition, make a custom event to bind that to. And then if we were playing forward, what we're going to do is we're going to delay uh, for like, let's say, 0 0.5 seconds. Seems pretty good. And then we're going to want to play the transition out screen. Well, you can just usually pull that off from this create widget uh, node that we have here. Sometimes that's a little bit messy though. Uh, so I like to just promote that to a variable called that transition screen so that you have easier access to it as a variable over here. You can see that I actually already like, did this once. So we have just a normal object uh, variable for that as well. Uh, but yeah, transition screen. Uh, then we do the trans out event which again, we're just going to do with the default value. So no need to put in a texture there. And since we're already bound to this finished transition anyway, this same event is going to run again once this is done, but this time with play forward being false. So what we do there is we use our transition screen. We first unbind all events from transition finished, and then we remove from balance and we set our transition screen to being a value of nothing. This way, Unreal's garbage collection uh, will just do its job and remove this thing from memory. If you have a game where you're constantly going between levels, it might make sense to have a transition screen that's just always in memory and you don't like unbind and remove it. Uh, that's personally how I do it. I just have my transition screen always available. I just set it to being invisible and then when I use it, it's set to visible, does its thing and so on and so forth. For this particular case, uh, I'm just unbinding and removing it, but it really depends on how often you will be spawning in new ones. Because if you're constantly spawning in new ones very regularly, it might become a little bit of an issue that you're creating objects that you're discarding so quickly, very regularly. So do pay that a little bit of mind. 
Oh, and then of course, it is quite important to add this transition screen uh, to the viewport. So add to viewport as well. So now, when I press the F key, you can see we have our transition screen. Now, it's entirely white, which might not be uh, very good for the eyes. So in here, you can just set the image tint to being black instead, or any color that you want, really. Like, we can make it green, and then after we compile that, the transition screen will be entirely green. So you can make it any color you want. Uh, for, like, a loading screen transition, I think black just makes the most sense, because you don't want to assault your player's eyeballs too much. So black is probably the best. So that's how you make a quick little, like, transition screen wipe in Unreal Engine with a uh, easy, quick little material. Again, this entire project is up for download for patrons and YouTube members if you uh, want to check it out and play around with it and support the channel to uh, get more of this content. Maybe it really does help out. Next time, some more fun stuff. And a very big thank you to all my patrons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help support the channel or get any of the project files in any of my tutorials, there's a link down below to the Patreon page to support me or alternatively as a YouTube member. And of course, an extra massive thank you to my Cave Digger tier supporters, Sergey Thomas, and my Cave Student tier supporters, Oiku.